next talk, we are saying hi to Leonard um, Butcher, who is going to talk to us about his research projects, I think, about the astronomy and the climate crisis. So, have fun with Leo. But Leo is muted. Right. I've just been told that people aren't hearing me. Yes, they can hear me now. Great. So let's hope that things will now work. So I want to talk today about astronomy and the climate crisis, as announced. That's not really my research project. It's kind of my sideline research. So I would like to say first what I'm going to talk about. First of all, there is going to be an introduction, and I'm going to introduce myself and the topic. I will tell you how I got to get into this topic and then there are a few items about the actual topic so are there actually astronomical influence factors on the earth's on global the global climate uh, that has been claimed what's what is there with these claims then i'll give you a short introduction of what the climate crisis actually is but you will know this but just as a reminder and then the item, the, the main issue will be that there is no planet B, as you frequently hear in rallies. That is actually an astronomical statement. What does that mean and what can astronomy contribute to solving the climate crisis? So for the last one or two years, I have been fairly active in this. Firstly, in reducing our own greenhouse emissions as astronomers, first to understand them and then to reduce them, and then to see what we can actually communicate, how we can communicate the message that there is no planet B, no Earth-like planet, in a good way, hopefully leading to finally get some good, give people some, make people care well for this planet. So, what does an astronomer actually do? People, when I tell them that I'm an astronomer, think that I go out at night and into the field with a binocular, or with binoculars or a telescope and watch the stars. Yes, that is what astronomers did, but these days we don't really work this way, or quite rarely. Um, in my career for about 10 years, I was out observing for seven or eight times, mostly in Chile, where, where you see me here next to the very large telescope, as it's called, where you can spend a few nights observing and you can be lucky if you get one night or two there for every, once every one or two years. And then, of course, a lot of observing is done remotely. This is what that looks like for the computer friends among us. Uh, you can see that there are many computers involved. And of course, there is a large network and a lot of technology. And if you observe things such as this galaxy, uh, one of the closest closer galaxy, about 13 million, 13 million light years away. Um, and that's what that looks like on a screen, highly complex panels with all kinds of information. So you see the state uh, of a program that was running on the left, a very a very old programming language is Tickle TK from the 80s, if any of you remember. It's not easy, it's, it's fairly complex to program, but that's how much of the software works. And that shows me the state of an instrument and the results that you get are then processed live, so you can get an immediate impression whether it is what you're looking for. Um, that is one part of my work, that's the research, but the largest part of my work is actually to uh, get together a project for this new project, which will be the largest on Earth, called the Extremely Large Telescope. As you see, as you remember, the, the Chile one is called Very Large Telescope, the next one was to be called Overwhelmingly Large Telescope, but now that is going to be the name Extremely Large Telescope, and this instrument called METIS, with which you can look at Earth-like planets, in particular around a star system called Alpha Centauri, which is a triple star system, the closest one to us, and you know this from the trilogy A History of the Earth, if you've read it. Um, and there is a, another very nice Chinese science fiction. 
So Alpha Centauri A is the closest star and this probably has planets. And if they are any in any way like the Earth, uh, so they have the similar albedo, kind of a reflection index, that's what it would look like. Um, there is a fairly conspicuous dot here and a fainter dot. And uh, you could then see whether any of these is like the Earth. And we'll talk about what we can do with that later. But first, first of all, we are going to talk about astronomical influences on the Earth climate and what astronomy can contribute to solving the issues. So, first of all, astronomic influences. And some of you that have dealt, looked into astronomy may know that the Sun is not equally active over time. It has cycles. There is a 22 cycle. And this cycle of 22 years, within this cycle, the magnet field, magnetic field of the Sun reverses. Um, and because uh, that is a, a process with two ends, you say you half the time and you have an 11 year cyclus in which the activity of the sun changes. You will see that this with these solar spots that you can observe using very dark glasses. You have to use very, very dark glasses, otherwise your eyes will be terminally damaged or permanently damaged. Um, but it is possible to see these solar spots with the naked eye, but not right now. Now, um, um, if you have these glasses. So you'll have to wait another five years until they will be returned. So what does that have to do with the Earth's climate? There were some researchers or pseudo-researchers in the 70s and 80s that uh, created a lot of noise about this. So we have a global temperature curve here that is slowly rising, and below that the solar activity, the intensity of solar radiation, which led these people to say climate crisis, the climate change is all about the sunlight changing. But if you look a bit further, you see that that was only a random correlation for a limited amount of time between 1920 and 1960, more or less. And after that, these curves diverged quite a lot. The temperature kept rising, as we know, more than one degree now, more than one degree above the pre-industrial level. But solar activity goes up and down and doesn't really contribute to, to that. So this question can be quite clearly de declined sun's activity is not responsible for the change in the Earth's climate. And then there are the ice, age, the, the ice ages, of course, and there is a complex graph here that you may want to look at, but it's very insightful. Uh, first, let's look at the left. The x-axis shows you the age or the, the time in the past in kilo years. So the uh, left part, left-hand side is the present, and the right-hand part is 600,000 years ago. And the other graph is the uh, concentration of, a, of an oxygen isotope, uh, O18, uh, heavier than normal isotope, normal is 16. You find the 18 isotope in ice cores, um, because the heavier oxygen tends to fall down, it has more mass, so it will accumulate in ice cores. And if you um, see this isotope rising, then that gives you information that more water was in the ice phase. Um, and if you look at this so-called proxy across time, then you see that there are uh, peaks about every 100,000 years. And that is, in fact, the information that you take to say that every roughly 100,000 years, there were ice ages. And the last one, as we know, ended about 20,000 years ago. And you can see that here at the right-hand side. But if you look further back, you see that there is a regularity to that. And if you do a Fourier analysis and ask which frequencies are dominant here, you see that a cycle of 0 0.01 per kilo year, so 100th uh, per kilo year, which means a 100 once per 100,000 years frequency. That is a repetitive, repetitive pattern here. And people were wondering what that actually is, and were looking at various astronomical factors. For example, the Earth's orbit's eccentricity, so the non-roundedness, the non-circularity of the Earth's orbit, the Earth's orbit is an ellipsis, and the ellipsis changes somewhat. It, it kind of oscillates, not too very much. Then there is the actual tilt of the Earth's axis, the angle to the orbital plane, and that changes between these two values here. 
uh, between about 22 and 24 and a half degrees. Then there is the perihelion precession, which is quite interesting for relativity theory, for relativity, because that showed us for the first time that there is something like relativity in the planet's movement in the solar system, and these movements could not be predicted completely by Newtonian mechanics. And then there is the orbital inclination, the frame of reference being here, uh, here is the uh, plane in which the planets move, and that mainly is Jupiter as the heaviest planet, and the orbit is the orbit of one particular planet with respect to that, and the Earth's orbit is not exactly in this plane, but it is slightly inclined, a certain angle. And that changes. And again, you can look at those changes and um, plot them, the inclination over time, and you see that that is changing. You can run models on that. And the cycle is, this frequency is similar to the one that we found for the ice ages, once every 100,000 years. And that is the signal that tells us that the change of the orbital inclination um, one, every 100,000 years could actually be a major contributing factor for the Ice Ages. And uh, an astronomer called Milankovic, shortly after the First World War, re realized this. And the theory that we have is that within the ecliptic itself, there's a lot of dust from comets, asteroids, and whatever, um, from the time the solar system was created. And when Earth goes through this plane, or uh, spends its orbit in that plane, then there is a lot of dirt, roughly speaking, and that leads to a cooling and to volcanic eruptions and an ice age. That is the theory behind it. It's all theory for now, but it is a cycle that has an astronomical correlation, but it's a very long cycle, a very slow one. If you compare this to the CO2 concentration that we see now, it's very clear that over these 100,000 years, the CO2 concentration changes, but what is happening right now at the zero point, it's an extreme peak. We're just coming out of the last ice age at this point, and suddenly, we are at a level, uh, at a normal level, uh, about 280 um, parts per million uh, in the air, that is the share of uh, CO2 particles in the air, but that share has dramatically risen in the last, uh, in recent days. It's, it's, it's about it's about 300 and uh, uh, looks like 380 in the graph, but it's much stronger than it was in the last 100,000 years. And there is a nice graph by uh, a physicist who is very good in making these statements succinct and, and, and to the point, that's the XKCD comic, and you can see us starting 200 thousand years in the past, with the temperature then 22,000 years, so the temperature was about four degrees below what we have now, and by now we are by at one degree above, and if we don't do anything we will be at two degrees above, so that is quite a difference. Um, so, and a bit a bit earlier, 10,000 years before um, the present, we reached the temperature that we had, and the, it stayed quite constant over time. Um, and now, in the last few years, the rise is so extreme, so fast, that that really is a climate crisis. So, to summarize, the contributions to Global warming, as I've said, solar contribution can be seen, but overall the net contribution is not really there. And then there are there are other variables there. Vol volcanoes can have a contributing contribution there. They can lead to cooling, but the human contribution is by far the largest. So there's no way there's no way of saying that there are other reasons for that. But not everything is uh, bleak and grey. Um, this is from a website about the, called the Climate Action Tracker, uh, partly built by the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research, one of the leading research institutes uh, on the climate, and they list what uh, the national national contributions that were agreed upon in the Paris Agreement to what extent they would help. 
to reach uh, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees which is what we want and we see that at the moment uh, things seem to be working perfectly as we think we are about a, at about 2.1 degrees warming which is not that bad um, but it could be much worse so to me this means in particular that there is hope but you really have to finally get active. Don't just exit from coal uh, electricity production in 2038, but earlier. It can be done, but you really have to do it. So what can the astronomy do? So real problem, uh, we cannot really do much about the big uh, issues, but what can we contribute? And one thing we can do is uh, reduce our own carbon emissions, uh, because it's not that small. And the second thing is to report uh, about what astronomy can report about these issues. So uh, my colleagues uh, in Heidelberg from the Max Planck Institute uh, have calculated uh, how many uh, CO2 emissions they're producing. And you can see that uh, half of uh, all the emissions are due to flights uh, taken by members of the Institute. So, uh, uh, and electricity is another 30 of that. So, uh, uh, electricity production can be made green. Uh, flights are much more complicated. Uh, you cannot simply uh, go to the US uh, or, or Australia uh, uh, by any other means. So uh, per person, that's about nine tons uh, for one year. And uh, you can uh, 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 break that down per article published and uh, or uh, as as a german uh, uh, citizen you can you can calculate uh, how much how much emission you have per person uh, for for example 11 tons for a german citizen or 1.6 tons for an indian uh, other colleagues at the european southern observatory uh, they have uh, calculated uh, that most of their uh, emissions come from electricity produced and uh, that uh, that is mainly due to the fact that um, uh, the electricity is uh, produced by burning fossil fuels um, and uh, the reason uh, Chile has been picked in the first place uh, is that uh, that uh, yeah, in those places uh, there's uh, almost always sunshine, very very, very low humidity, um, but that means that during the day, day uh, the entire installation has to be cooled, so it's cool enough at night um, to uh, make the observations. And uh, the third uh, study uh, I was involved myself in, and uh, we we looked specifically at flights uh, for a conference. Um, in 2019, we had a conference in Lyon, and uh, we we looked at who's uh, uh, producing most of the emissions, and uh, we can see that uh, most of the emissions come from a very small uh, set of participants. And uh, we can see how many people have made how many trips. And uh, it wasn't that many trips, but a lot of emissions. Um, if, because uh, a flight from Sydney to Lyon uh, takes a lot more uh, than, for example, from Amsterdam to Lyon. And of course, if you can move uh, to trains, uh, that makes it uh, a lot better as well. So uh, a solution needs to be found for long-haul flights. And uh, so that has been reduced uh, involuntarily through the pan pandemic. Um, so the conference uh, last year uh, took place, um, but uh, completely online. And so we had a direct comparison of what the uh, emissions were. Uh, we can quickly look at that. Uh, for the computer fans. Uh, so we, we asked around um, how, how 
how how how intensely they uh, took part um, of these uh, yeah about five five and a half hours um, and how mu how much emissions uh, the laptops produced uh, by by using electricity and and uh, the, we took the average uh, uh, CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour uh, uh, in in Germany that's a lot more in France uh, it's a lot less the 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 network uh, uses a lot of electricity um, so uh, the 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 amount of CO2 needed uh, for transferring one gigabyte uh, is going down every year uh, so that's getting much more efficient um, and uh, we use Zoom uh, as the video service, and um, and the assumption was that uh, we were uh, using a single server for that, um, so that wasn't a lot. So in total, uh, for uh, 1,800 people, um, took together only as much CO2 as a single return flight from Liverpool to Lyon. Uh, so it's uh, a factor of 3,000 uh, less in CO2 usage for that conference. A very good example. Uh, it worked really well. We had discussion forums, uh, like here at DIVOC, and, and people enjoyed it a lot. And so it's easy to work together without having to travel that far. Finally. Uh, the second point, uh, uh, what what can astronomy help uh, do about uh, climate change and uh, what perspective can it uh, contribute and uh, communicate about uh, things? And uh, as an example, I took this uh, wonderful picture uh, that was taken by the crew of Apollo 8. Um, they did not land on the moon, uh, they just circled the moon before returning to Earth. And uh, after uh, going around the moon for the first time, uh, they they saw uh, how, how beautifully the, the Earth was rising across the moon. Um, so, so they were completely fascin fascinated by the Earth rising, um, very blue, a lot of water. Um, and just black around it. Uh, this view towards Earth, uh, very special. And um, so, so our planet is is kind of uh, a, a spaceship itself. Um, much, much more uh, intense impression uh, for this view uh, we get from this later image. Uh, called play, pale blue dot. Um, depending on the video quality, you might see uh, this very small pic, uh, uh, dot, uh, 0 0.2 pixels. That is Earth as seen from Voyager 1, um, beyond the orbit of Neptune. And this probe uh, was turned around uh, to look back, uh, not looking forward, but looking back. Uh, back to Earth and uh, take a picture, uh, not just from Earth, of, of Earth, but uh, uh, of the entire uh, planetary system. And uh, this was very risky because uh, turning uh, the probe around meant that the antenna uh, would point away from Earth uh, for taking this picture. And so they had to write a program that would turn uh, the probe, uh, take the picture, then turn it back around uh, to have the antenna point back to Earth. And uh, that, of course, worked. It's still working. It, it's still d delivering data. And uh, it has uh, delivered data from beyond uh, uh, what is considered the border of the solar system. And this image uh, is uh, is really a wow moment for many, many people. Uh, this one little uh, pixel makes it very clear that this is the only place in the universe we have. And uh, if we look towards exoplanets, um, um, 
We already over 4,000 planets uh, have been discovered outside of our solar system, and none of those discovered so far uh, do we know that it's like Earth. We don't of not of a single one that has liquid water on it. So we don't know that yet. And even if we knew it existed, we couldn't travel there. Uh, we could a uh, we we could build a spaceship that could travel there over hundreds or thousands of years, but it's not a plan uh, to save Earth. And and th th that also uh, applies to plans from uh, of very. Um, uh, self-convinced uh, entrepreneurs like Elon Musk. So, what else can astronomy do, do for us? So, uh, if when it's dark, we can see lots of stars. And, uh, of course, that is extremely fascinating. Uh, we can see uh, the Milky Way uh, is taken from uh, Chile. And uh, the the laser is pointing at uh, the black hole in the center of the galaxy. And uh, it's in the, the understanding the, the, the incredible distances, uh, thousands of light years. Uh, they're so immense that uh, if we were if we were look to back uh, back to Earth from there, uh, it would be impossible to spot. So there is no other option. We cannot go anywhere else. Uh, so if we take a further look, uh, a wider look, uh, we we see a huge number of galaxies like our own. And in our galaxy, we have about 200 billion stars. And uh, we have about 200 billion galaxies in the universe that we can observe. But uh, in, in, the, in the area we can observe uh, with the limits of light speed and everything, everything we... So on average, we have 200 billion galaxies, which each have 200 billion stars. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get into touch with other civilizations, but uh, that's not anytime soon. And uh, we shouldn't get distracted from the problems we have here today on Earth. Uh, okay, that's it. Uh, uh, I started uh, a bit late, uh, but uh, here I have uh, 10 minutes left. I uh, had planned for half an hour. So we figured uh, we give you a bit of time uh, uh, to not stress you out. And uh, we can tell the viewers that the question pad is open. And uh, you can find it in the Fahrplan, in the schedule. Uh, if you look at the details of the talk, uh, there is a link uh, in the description to this question pad. So let me give you a quick summary then. And uh, and uh, having a nice uh, discussion might be uh, nicer than, than just uh, talking at, at the black screen. So the most important things really about my talk uh, there are astronomical influences on our climate, uh, the changes to in the inclination uh, relative to the ecliptic. So probably it is the source uh, of uh, the uh, about 100,000 year cycle uh, for the ice ages. But it has nothing to do with the situation we find in uh, ourselves in right now. And uh, also changes in the sun are not affecting our climate uh, like we're seeing right now. Um, all of that is really caused by our own behavior. Um, what's really important is we have we are seeing this uh, unbelievably fast change uh, in the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Um, we, the humanity will not end, 
but uh, our civilization might be. So if if there's not enough drinking water, the uh, it gets too hot, uh, the sea level rises, that will uh, change the way we can live a lot. So what can astronomers do about that? Um, we can uh, be critical of our own behavior, our own CO2 usage, and there is a lot of uh, places that are far away from Europe uh, or the Northern Hemisphere in, in, in general. Um, so uh, in those places, uh, green energy use uh, is not very advanced. And uh, moving moving away from fossil uh, energy sources uh, is a big thing. And the big thing, of course, for us is uh, to allow people to better understand the fascination and uh, the, 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 the take a look at, from the cosmic perspective as uh, the small uh, marble of that the Earth is a very special place. Um, we know of no other place like it in the universe, and we really have to work on this together to uh, work on this problem because it's the only one we have. Okay, so <laughs> that's uh, about the end of the about 30 minutes, and I'm very happy uh, to start the discussion. And uh, over to the Herald. Thank you very much. That was an unbelievable, unbelievably interesting talk and uh, seeing all these great examples that you've uh, put together and we 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 are getting uh, some questions and also notes and uh, here's a little reminder there is a uh, self-organized session uh, after this uh, where you can continue this, the discussion so while people are still writing questions uh, into the pad, um, when you started uh, working in uh, in astronomy, did you ever envision that you would talk about the climate? Um, no, definitely not. Uh, absolutely the opposite. Um, one of the big things for me really was uh, to be able to travel. Uh, that was one of the reasons uh, I thought uh, astronomy might be a nice field to work in. And so uh, during uh, education, you, you, you get a lot of opportunities to travel to all kinds uh, of places in a very international environment. And uh, I, since living in, in the Netherlands for the past four years with my family, and uh, okay, am, am I going to buy a house here? So, uh, so being able to travel was a big thing. Um, and yeah, we, we, we did buy the house. Um, it's really a problem that. Uh, it's 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 a problem that will increase significantly in the next next uh, couple of decades, and I only realized that in the past couple of years. And uh, I I talked about it with my colleagues, um, mostly women, uh, who are very active uh, to to work uh, against the climate change. Uh, somebody writes in the pad. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you are producing uh, a lot of uh, enviable optimism. Um, I had the same thought during your talk. Um, are you seeing chances that uh, starting from the science community uh, with the conferences, etc., um, can 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 we uh, manage to make that change? Uh, thank you for that comment as well. I think from the scientific perspective, we can show a lot. Uh, we can be an example and can can show how international cooperation can work without having to travel all the time. 
Um, so everybody has seen that during the past year, um, and astronomy is a particularly international field. Um, we work together with pretty much people from all over the world, uh, uh, Brazil, Chile, uh, the US, Europa. Um, and being able to do that uh, online and having the tools to do that, that helps a lot. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was uh, part of a conference that happened in a virtual reality system. Um, uh, I, I, I got an Oculus Rift and had to use Facebook for that, but it was very interesting and uh, lots of things were possible. And I think it will become more and more normal to do these kinds uh, of things. And towards the optimism, I want to say, I, I, I hope I'm not blindly optimistic. Um, and and, and I, I often see it in very dark colors and and uh, how how the rainforests are uh, torn down and 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 how how slowly uh, the exit from coal power plants is happening in germany and i see all that and i'm very 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 angry and and sad about it and that politicians are not thinking far enough but despite all these developments, uh, a lot has happened in the past six years since uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, not enough yet, but um, the Climate Action Tracker is showing that very well, and it's going in the right direction. And I'm, I'm hoping that this is not a linear development where things are, are getting uh, better uh, linearly, step by step, but that we, uh, that what I think um, that uh, the, the problems are, are going to be more visible um, and uh, that we can increase the speed of change, um, for example, by the increase in solar panels installed. And, and, and I'm he really hoping that we get to the point, hopefully in the next few years, um, Okay, now now we have to uh, have to do it. It's it's economically viable and 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 do the change for real, and uh, that that uh, we 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 can increase taxes on, for example, coal power plants so they become uneconomical and can be shut down. Uh, that sounds like a very sensible vision of the future, and uh, we I hope we can work on that all together. So, we have no more questions in the pad, or are waiting for uh, the session to talk to you directly. And somebody is writing into the pad one more thing, we'll wait quickly for that. So, if you had a wish, Free, what, 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 would, what would it be? Uh, one more wish. So I I I I, I got a similar question. Uh, so uh, I, I who would you like to talk to if you could choose freely? And I said I want to uh, talk to Chancellor Angela Merkel. Um, she's a physicist. Uh, she knows all this, um, but she's not doing enough, despite clearly. Uh, knowing all this, and I, I, I would really wish she would, uh, in the last month uh, of her uh, tenure, uh, she would uh, make some real decisions and shut down the coal power plants by 2025, for example. Uh, excellent, uh, fantastic uh, wish. Uh, if, if, if I had the possibility, I, I would uh, try to do that immediately. Uh, the one question that was added, it's slightly off topic, uh, but also very fitting. Uh, so, as a chosen uh, Dutch person, uh, are you uh, riding bikes a lot? Uh, so, my family and I have uh, ridden bikes a lot in the past, and, uh, and of course, we, we are riding more bikes. Uh, for three years ago, we actually sold our car. 
Um, and here in the Netherlands, uh, uh, you don't really need a car. Uh, you can use a buck feeds, uh, a, a bike uh, with with a basket in front. Um, so I don't think we're we're using bikes a lot or more than others. Uh, but uh, just the normal amount that is this very usual here in the Netherlands and uh, it's it's absolutely normal here uh, not everybody does it uh, there are, there are people who drive their kids uh, to school in a car but at the same time uh, we, we 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 ride bikes a lot more yeah yeah maybe if I had a second uh, wish free um, um, what what value uh, real bike lanes have? So that is a that is a very good thing. Yeah, it would help. Yeah, people pe people uh, who don't like to drive uh, ride bikes uh, in cities uh, because, like me, had an almost uh, uh, bad accident. So. I, one question I'll take with us, uh, with a short answer. Uh, how do you feel about civil disobedience as a form of political protest? Uh, d d paint your own bicycle lanes? Why not? Um, yeah, uh, they have to be safe. Um, so. Uh, um, so maybe it's probably uh, something like Extinction Rebellion, which who I have worked with in the past. Um, so to a certain extent, we we need a certain amount of uh, civil disobedience uh, to to wake people up. Um, Extinction Rebellion uh, has done uh, demonstrations and actions uh, in, in in at the airport in Amsterdam, Schiphol, uh, the largest uh, uh, airport in uh, Europe, and uh, they did a die-in, and and that created a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of media attention, especially if the police uh, are overreacting to that. So that's helpful. And uh, of course, uh, you have to make sure that uh, the activists themselves uh, are safe. But uh, I think it's really important to get media attention. Um, it has to be represented in the media much more. Okay, let's uh, take that as the final word. Uh, Leo, thank you. Uh, I hope we see more of you soon. And uh, then...